I'm David Nishaw, Chief Executive of RL360, and today we're at our headquarters, International House, on sunny Isle of Man. Happy accident. Oh, well, I hope it was a happy accident. Oh, complete serendipity. I've never planned my career. In fact, I'm still trying to work out what my career plan should be. And I started off life thinking I was going to be a lawyer. And I did my law degree, I did my solicitor's exams, went to work for a firm of solicitors in London. And then I decided that wasn't for me, so I became a tour guide in Florida instead. Then I came back thinking I need a proper job, although in retrospect, tour guide's a great job, if any of you are thinking of it. What, what was and that like, tour guide? Oh, career? fantastic, I loved it. How old did you be then? 22, 23. Yeah. I didn't do it. I didn't plan it. I was on holiday. I was, went on holiday with my girlfriend and then she had to go back and I had an extra few days. So I was meeting a friend of mine who was training to be a priest at Yale. And so he and I decided Miami was the place. He was spending his summer in Miami. So we went down. I met up with him in Miami and then we went out to a bar. And, and the bar at about two in the morning, I met these guys running a travel company. and. A, they invited me around for breakfast the next day, went around for breakfast, and they offered me a job as a tour guide. So I said yes. So I phoned the lawyers, so I'm not coming back, and my then girlfriend and my mother. My mother cried. Who said, I bet your mum give you some stick. Well, she thought, I was about, she thought I'd been kidnapped by Moonies. <laughs> and, and mothers like their children being things like solicitors and accountants, because they think it sounds good. And so my mother was upset, and um, then that, that was it. So I did that for a year. And then I could have stayed out there, but in the end I decided it was just a year of fun. It wasn't my life, so I came back to London. Uh, got a job working for the Times and Sunday Times in the advertising and marketing department, which is in the early days of Murdoch. So um, that was fantastic. I loved that. I loved working for a Murdoch organisation. Hard-working, business-like, um, really making things happen. It was a wonderful two or three years. But then I was approached by an advertising agency in the West End, moved around two or three agencies, and I end up as client services director of a small agency that had some financial services clients. And one of them was Swiss Life, and I was having lunch with the chief executive of Swiss Life, and he turned around and said, how do you fancy being marketing director of Swiss Life? And I said, I don't know anything about insurance. And he said, don't worry, David, nobody else does either. So on that basis, <laughs> I accepted the job of, and then I'm suddenly in financial services. Well, I worked for Swiss Life and some advisors who are in the UK will remember this. Uh, we set up Swiss Life's uh, protection business in the UK, term assurance, critical illness, etc. And we invaded the advisor market in about 95 and uh, did quite well, it became one of the fastest growing companies. And then I left the UK Arm of Swiss Life to take on a pan-European role for Swiss Life. But the short story is that probably didn't suit my temperament as much as I'd hoped. So I was looking for an exit, and then somebody I knew was then a director of Royal London Group and suggested me for a role as Group Business Development Director of Royal London. So I joined them and then after about a year and a half, somebody said, we have this little offshore division we inherited when we bought Scottish Life. Um, we want someone to go in and sort of do a reappraisal of its strategy and operations. And so I was seconded on for what I thought would be six months. And then I was promised it'd be no more than two years. And that was um, 14 years ago. And here I am still uh, here, still running the business. Of course, the fundamental shift was the buyout from the group. So we're now an independent business and that took place in November 13. Well, I had the chance to sort of, with Mike Krillin and Simon Pack, the two directors who were there then and still with me now, to say, what would we really like to do with the business and how do we want to build it and grow it? And it's very rare in life, you get that opportunity and because it was small and at the time not profitable, the plan, if it worked, was just going to get rid of that problem for the group and turn it into a profitable little division. So they basically said, just get on with it. And I, 
I'm forever grateful for Royal London Group to give us the freedom to turn the business around and the space and time to help it grow. And I think being a mutual allowed them to give us that space and time in a way which a publicly listed group might not have been able to do. And in some ways that's probably the most exciting, slightly stressful period we ever had because we turned it from a very small division into something that had a future and a meaning. And that was a two to three year key process between 04 and 07, which I think those of us that were there at the time will probably never forget. And then leading to an MPO. Well, that was extraordinary. The, the background to this was that, that an American organization had made an approach to the group about buying us because they saw the potential to being a hub for the way the business was changing and future M&A possibilities. But for various reasons, that conversation died a death. They couldn't really agree how to make it work. On that basis, we said, well, if the group's willing to entertain somebody, an outsider, to buy this company, and it hasn't worked, why don't we see if we can do it? So we went to the group and said, would you let us have a go? They were a bit surprised, uh, but we created a business plan. We went out into the markets, found potential investors, and went back to the group and they said, okay, we'll give you a three months to make it work. And we got agreement with Royal London within that three months. Uh, we've been an independent business ever since. That was concluded. So we shook hands with Royal London in May 13 and completed in November. Going back in time to the preparations for conduct of business, I think it was hugely important. The regulator and indeed the government wanted to make sure that the Isle of Man was a good base to do business, honourable, good governance foundations, and we ag agree with that and approved it. To make sure there was consistency and understanding, the MIA, the Manx Insurance Association, was hugely important in making sure that the, all the operators, all the life companies, really understood the implications and how to implement them. The MIA's role in conduct of business isn't so much what it's doing today, it's what it was doing a year ago. And if you go back a year, I think the MIA and the work of its senior officials was crucial. I am passionate about Isle of Man as a base because what we do matters. If we were just selling you know, wine gums or sunglasses, there's a limit to how much it really matters what the after sales care or whether the base is still the same base in five years time because there's a life expectancy to these products and there's also a materiality to people's lives. But where you're based is an acceptance of how you want to be governed and governanced and how much governance matters to you as a company and how much it matters that you take seriously that you can return clients money or that there is a, some sort of process by which funds are accepted onto the platform or that the clients in some exceptional circumstance can understand the compensation rules or that there's an ombudsman. These things really, really matter. And therefore we need to know we're working with advisors to whom it matters well. If I was an advisor, I think the jurisdiction from where they choose their financial products is one of the most fundamental things an advisor can do is make that choice. And I believe that advisors should be making choice based on the quality of the jurisdiction and that's why I believe in the Isle of Man, because I think it's good for the clients and it allows advisors to sleep at night. People do ask about FPI quite often, and that's fair enough, because it's a sizable company, it's a well-known brand in our market. So people obviously want to know, you know how this process is going to play out. All I can say is, is that we shook hands with Aviva, the owners of FPI, a while ago now. And, but nothing completes and, and, until everything completes. So there's a whole lot of stuff to go through. It's like you know, exchanging on a house and then you've got to get to completion. And there's surveys to be done and there's you know, various other bits and pieces uh, you know, defining what was or wasn't. You know, was that fireplace included in the fixtures and fittings? So, so that process has taken longer than we thought. And along the way, there's been changes at both regulator level and other level about how you do this stuff. And so we had to slightly change the way in which we went about closing out the deal. 
through lots of conversations with Aviva. But those conversations, for, as far as Aviva and ourselves are concerned, have concluded very amicably. And we see no reason, either party, why this deal won't conclude in a brilliant way. The actual timing of it is probably more a matter for Aviva and RL360 than it is for anybody else being blunt. Uh, you know, FPI is carrying on doing its thing. We haven't stopped it doing anything that it otherwise wasn't in its business plan two years ago. Uh, it's carrying on being FPI. We're carrying on being us. So I understand people's interest, um, but the deal is going ahead. And uh, as far as I'm aware, and as far as Aviva is concerned, uh, there is um, nothing that's happening that really has any effect on uh, any advisors or their custom or the customers. Um, apart from people's interest to see all the see the deal closed and, and moving on. It's always interesting to review where you might go and where you've come from. The way I am, I, it, because you're living in the process of growing the company over several years, you, you don't always see that as transforming as you might do if you're an outside observer. You're just in it day to day. How can we make it better? Can we build more relationships with advisors? Can we launch new products? Can we go to other countries? And you're just constantly refreshing and doing and refreshing and doing as you go. Um, as it happens, we have just recently set about looking at another five-year plan which is, we hope, quite transformative. I can't share that with anyone today. And I'm really excited about what that might do, because if it succeeds, it will change the company fundamentally again for the better. Not everything always happens when you want it to happen or how you want it to happen, but if you have a clear path and commitment, and let's face it, money, you can usually make most of those things happen most of the time. So there's always a bit to a strategy that don't work out quite how you want it. But if you're going in the right direction, doing the right things and making them happen, then I, um, I, I'm more interested in what's going to coming down the track in five years. I don't really tend to look back very often because it's already a done deal. Work is quite a serious thing, but that doesn't mean that Every working day is, is a sort of grind of, of, of seriousness and minutiae. You know, why do I have a wrestling mask on my desk? I have a wrestling mask on my desk because it represents for me a trip to Latin America where I went out some people to see, what's it called, Nacho Libra or something, is that the yeah. name of it? And we had a fun night out and I just bought the mask on a whim from a street vendor. So that represents to me when I'm on these trips, again, I'm meeting advisors, you go out for dinner, you meet, you talk about them and their world. And uh, so for fun in work, I think the day it stops being fun is probably the day I'll be fired anyway. So I enjoy it because I think um, it's about working with the people. But I, I, in case that sounds too trite, let me be also clear. It's also about winning. Business the business world is, is very competitive. And although we all get on, we are competing against each other. And I'm in absolutely no doubt that I want RL360 to have the best products, the best service, the best distribution relationships, good governance, working from a good governan governance island. And I want to blow the competition away. I'm sorry, that is the crunch answer to your question. I want to make sure we win big time in this market. That's really what it's about. But I want to enjoy that process as well.